so excited to be here today. I, it is the first time that I'm doing a live stream uh, and it's, it's, it's something I've been looking forward to because I've done a lot of television, but I haven't really done this live in front of a, an audience that's going to be interacting with me. So we have one wine, we have two Burgundies and we have two Bordeaux. So the very first wine that we have is this white wine, 2013, Domaine du Mal Clerc, and it's a, a Chaume Gaufrio. It's, it's a Bon Appellation, and it's, if, you, if you look at the name and you read everything on the label, it looks very complicated because the name is so long. Domaine du Mal Clerc and Chaume Gaufrio from the region of Bonne in France. Well, we know it's a Burgundy first by the very sensual shape of the bottle. And I'm gonna pour myself a little bit to have a live tasting with all of you. But I thought really with, with um, this first introduction of white Burgundy, it would be very interesting to really talk about the, the region as a whole. Now, I'm sure that all of you are aware of the popularity of Burgundy and how people who have really been you know, brought up and familiar with Bordeaux are now more and more gravitating and finding a lot of joy in Burgundy. So there's the simple part and the more difficult part about Burgundy. So let's talk first about the, the, the simple part, which is when you have a white wine from Burgundy, you know that it's from Chardonnay. It can come from the very cool region of Chablis where it's more lean, citrus, and minerally. Or it can come from the warmer region of Macon. But here for these two Burgundies that we have, we're coming from the heart of really classy, classic, very highly collectible and the most well-regarded Burgundy. It's the heart called the Côte d'Or. And it means Côte are the hills and Dor means the golden slopes. So it's the golden slopes of Burgundy that really offer you the very best white from Chardonnay and red from Pinot Noir. This vintage is a 2013. Um, and for Burgundy 2013, 12, 11, 10, all these vintages have a lot of meaning because for, for all Burgundy wines, the climate is really on the borderline of ripening Chardonnay and Pinot Noir properly. What that means is that not every year are the grapes fully, fully ripened. And there's a lot of weather climatic challenges. And 2013 was one of the vintages that was quite challenging, especially for reds. So the quantity was very small because there was a lot of sorting, but in for white wines for 2013, there's a lot of freshness and concentration. So this has a beautiful lemon color. The nose I love immediately because it's not fruity. There's no tropical fruits here. It's all about minerality, sensual, citrus. And I made notes on this wine already. And the word that came to my mind over and over again is that this white is lively. It's energetic. It has energy, like uh, electricity running through the wine because of its acidity. Mm. On the palate, there are delicate layers of some citrus, like pomelo and grapefruit. But honestly, the wine is very pure and fresh lively and this is what sets apart great white burgundy from chardonnay from anywhere around the world so i'm happy to take any of your questions uh, about this wine and i am also live looking at questions so i can definitely answer any if you have but if i were to talk about how this uh, white was made it's a very classic way of making white burgundy. It's, har it's hand harvested and pressed right away and put into barrels for fermentation, French barriques. And this particular one had about 20% new French oak barrels. You can taste it because when you have um, not just the, the, the oak um, 
barrels for fermentation, but when you have about 20% new, you've got a lot of interaction with the oxygen in the wine. It gives it a roundness, a fullness, and sometimes a little bit of spicy and toastiness. And this wine is very subtle. So you know that there wasn't too much new oak, but still there is good body and wonderful tension. Uh, this is a white burgundy that I would drink almost with, with anything as an aperitif or if it's paired, especially with any seafood dish, I'm thinking of you know, steamed fish, stir fried prawns, um, so many dishes that would work well, especially because of its acidity. And because there is such freshness and liveliness, it works well even if you have slightly stronger sauces. So with Sichuan sauce, not too spicy of course, but just mildly spicy, this is a, a very good pairing as well. And I want to talk a little bit also about uh, Burgundy as a region, because besides um, this Bon white, we have also another Bon. This is a red. And before we taste the second um, Burgundy, I want to talk a, a little bit about you know Burgundy as a whole, because it's a region that as more people are becoming interested, they also find it very difficult to learn. Part of the reason is because there's so much information on the label. And the one thing to know very clearly is that the biggest name on the label, it's not the producer, this is Domaine de Clos, but it's actually the name of the region, the place, the place name. So here you're looking at Bon Premier Cru, and in terms of all the producers, there's about 1,100 producers just in Côte d'Or. In all of Burgundy, there's over 3,000. So in the heart of Burgundy, the Côte d'Or region, where both of these Bonne uh, wines come from, you can see that, that, that there is a lot of choice. So 1,100 producers, and for the Premier Cru, even the Premier Cru, there is 375 Premier Crus. And a lot of village names as well as commune names. So when you see a Grand Cru, for example, it will tell you on the label, for example, Musini Grand Cru, Chambertin Grand Cru, Claude de Bez, uh, there's actually 32 Grand Crus in Côte d'Or. And you know that when you have the Grand Cru, that it's one of only less than 2% of the total volume and the total yield of Burgundy. So it's a very special wine, even Premier Crus, of which there are only about 15%. It, it makes up a very small proportion of all of the Burgundies, which really is majority is village and what we call generic. And so generic Burgundy is called Bourgogne. And you have Bourgogne Rouge, Bourgogne White, uh, Blanc. Um, and when you see those, first of all, you know that they're great value for money because generic uh, level at that level is the widest and the greatest majority of wines. Then the next level up, the village wines are also about 50%, but they're, they're actually quite rare, rare too, because from the very top producers, um, the, the village wines become downgraded to Bourgogne. So here we have a Bon Premier Cru. This is the second Burgundy. And the vintage is 2008. So it's about eight years old and it's got a little bit of age on it. So perfect time to drink a village and a premier cru is really when it's at least five years old. And the color, as you might expect from a burgundy red, is actually quite pale, not very strong in color. And color, as you know, very different from all the other regions, except for potentially Piedmont and a few others, but color is no indication of the wine's intensity. 
So it can be very pale in color and have amazing concentration and intensity, which is the magic of Pinot Noir. And already, just, just from the nose, I'm thinking that this is uh, a, a red burgundy that's going to give me some elegant, pure, lovely, delicate flavors because the nose is about red strawberries, it's about raspberries, it has amazing um, intensity of floral notes, which very few young wines, and this is an eight-year-old Burgundy, have uh, at this stage because you can get violets and jasmine and some really great uh, floral notes from Bordeaux, but it's, it's not that common in a wine that's less than 10 years old. So here, this is the magic of, of Bordeaux, where uh, you see that Bordeaux has the structure and the and the and the and the uh, grip and the palate intensity. And here with Burgundy, it's totally the opposite. You can almost not drink it and enjoy the wine just from the nose. And I think this is one of the reasons why I love Burgundy so much because there is this sensual quality. There is um, the intense perfume, so the, the joy and aroma um, of what you get just on the nose is as much as what you get on the palate. So what I really enjoy about this Bon Premier Cru and it's a 2008 Domaine des Clos Champ Piment, uh, a Bon Premier Cru, as I mentioned, that really um, impresses me on the first taste is because of its youthfulness and its vibrancy. And not every wine, especially a Bon Premier Cru at this age, has that kind of lift and aromatic intensity, as well as this freshness and acidity. And the tannins are absolutely silky. And what is great about Bon Premier Cru is that it's one of the underrated places in Burgundy that you can go for great value. And why does it have such great value? Well, among all the Premier Crus in Burgundy, Bon is the largest village. So in, in Bon itself, there are 411 hectares, which is a very large area for Burgundy. And that means that you get a wide range of, you know, some good solid bone, but also very exceptional bone Premier Cruz. And there isn't any Grand Cruz in bone, so there isn't the prestige that you might have for Gevry Chambretin as a village. Uh, is, is considered very prestigious because there's so many great Grand Cru's within Gevry Chambertin. But Bonne doesn't have any, but it has numerous, very good quality Premier Cru's. The second reputation of Bonne as a region, um, and why it isn't so expensive, is because there are so many negociants, uh, Jadot, Drouin, Bouchard, uh, all great negociants that are based in bone and making quite a lot of bone. And people think it's because of the volume, because it's negociants rather than domains. Uh, and we know that negociants are the large brokers. They don't necessarily all own uh, the vineyards, but they do buy from all the best farmers. Uh, when you compare them with the small domains that cultivate and um, take care of their own vineyard, we have this perception that maybe the domains are, are better. They certainly often are more expensive. But what's, what's really wonderful uh, about a domain like uh, Domaine des Clos, it's a very small producer, actually, in Bonn, six hectares, um, owned uh, and started not that long ago, in 1995, by Grégoire Bichot. Uh, he's done a fabulous job in the last 20 years, really building a reputation for very solid, lively, very pure, um, elegant uh, wines that actually, even for a Premier Cru, lasts pretty long. And I would think that this wine, eight years old, can still go on 
for at least uh, another five to eight years very well. And at a certain point, probably in the next year or two, we'll start to get a, a bit more of the developed um, age characters. What I love about Burgundy, when it gets a little bit more maturity and bottle age, for a premier crew between eight to 10 years, you start to get this secondary bottle age characters. You'll find here, you hardly find any, but you'll find some sweet spices, maybe some leather. You'll find hints of uh, black truffles, some mushrooms, uh, and it, it, they, they develop another personality, another level of appreciation, which I also really love. So 2008, again, for Burgundy, it's very important to talk about the vintage. So we talked about 2013 for the first white. 13 was challenging, small harvest, but the whites tend to be very good because of its good acidity. The reds have good concentration for the ones who took care and sorted. And we we'll talk about 12 as well, because 12 is another vintage that I think has a lot of potential and, and, and a really good approachability. It has nice concentration, roundness, and harmony. It wasn't one of the most intense vintages, but there is a lot of harmony in the 2012 vintage. Then we come to 11. And 2011 was a light vintage. I call it the dancer, the ballerina, who, who there, there's no weight, there's no heaviness. Both the reds and the whites have this wonderful lightness. And, and again, like the 12, the fruit has a, a very good approachability. Now, nine and 10, I'm not gonna go into too much because everyone knows the reputation of both the 2009 for its ripeness and generosity, the 2010 for its incredible power, concentration, and longevity. And those two vintages probably over the last 10 years are among the top vintages for Burgundy, just like in other parts of the world, like in Bordeaux. Then we come to this vintage, which is the 2008. And it's a little bit controversial because not everybody loves it, but 2008 for me is one of the underrated vintages and it's especially good for whites. And eight has lovely acidity. I love freshness. I love uh, the energy that uh, great acidity and lifted aromatics provide. Uh, and this is a very good example of why it takes not just tannins to age red burgundy, but it takes acidity too. And this is why the 2008 Bon Cru is still so fresh, so young, not a trace of, of uh, bottle age characters, and still going very, very strong. As I said with, uh, with burgundy, I can just smell the wine and get just as much pleasure and joy out of it. Mm -hmm. So let me look very quickly to see if anyone has any questions on Burgundy. And if there are, I'm very happy to take questions. Um, so far, let's see. I don't have any specific questions right now, so I'm gonna move on to, I'm gonna move on to um, the two Bordeaux that we have. And I, I always say to people that Bordeaux is uh, a style that most people, let's talk about um, you know, Western Europe or in North America, most people graduate and work towards a Bordeaux palette. But what's really interesting about what's happening in China uh, and most of Asia is that many people start out drinking Bordeaux, even as one of their first and earliest um, wines. And what that means um, as consumers for us is that for, for, for tannins, uh, for, for wines with this sort of uh, dark fruit and, and intensity, it's a style, a palette, and a, a kind of wine that we're, we're actually used to. So it, it, it is something that, um, you know, I think uh, we don't need to get familiar with. We don't need to really understand uh, the tannin profile. And also we're tea drinkers. So having tea um, means that 
we know what tannins are like. So I think Bordeaux is a, um, is a style and a region uh, that, that, that we enjoy. And it's the white wines and the acidity in the white wines that we usually end up having to get used to because it isn't something that we started out drinking. Um, and for most of the rest of the world, it's very interesting because it is white wines uh, with acidity and sometimes some sweetness that most wine lovers start with. And they, they get used to the acidity, they get used to the lightness. Um, and here, we uh, prefer wines with a bit of body, some guts, and um, a, a firm palate. So the third wine that I have uh, here is a Bordeaux. It's a Chateau Merrick from, from Medoc. And I'm sure all of you are very familiar with, with Bordeaux and the difference between right and left bank, but for some of you who may not be, I'll just very quickly go over the left and right bank references because this is something we, we say all the time. So left bank means we're left of the Gironde River and that means that the majority of um, the, the grapes that are planted on the left bank is Cabernet Sauvignon. Uh, there is, of course, Merlot and Cabernet Franc, which is what we have on the right bank, as well as Merlot. But it's, it's definitely, in general, um, not the key central figure. But of course, this varies very much because um, some of the second wines of the top uh, Cru Classé, for example, in Bordeaux, uh, the second wines are often made up of a majority of Merlot. And, and why? Because Merlot is softer, it's more approachable, it's round, and for second wines, it's meant to be consumed and, and um, enjoyed earlier than the Grand Vin. So um, this is a strategy that a lot of the chateaus in Bordeaux use. So Chateau Merrick is um, a very old um, property, and you can see that um, really that the chateaus, um, when you start from the center of Bordeaux, moving down to the Grave, Pesec Leonion region, historically, this is where the really old plantings of Bordeaux started from 300, 400 years ago, and way back even during the Roman times, like a thousand, two thousand years ago. So the, the center of cultivation and vineyards started out in this, the Grave region near Bordeaux and spread north and spread east. Um, and here in uh, Medoc, you see that with Cabernet Sauvignon, which is the majority, this particular blend is about 52% Cabernet Sauvignon and about 34% um, Merlot. And the rest is actually Petit Verdot which is quite unusual. Um, Petit Verdot, uh, a variety that takes quite a lot of warmth, sunshine, and uh, warmer weather to ripen, is, is not particularly favored in Bordeaux because not every year is warm enough. Um, about it uh, briefly in Burgundy, but in Bordeaux as well, 2011 was considered a very light vintage. And what, what that means is it took quite an effort for the chateaus to get the grapes ripe. So often they had grapes that came in at less than 12% alcohol, so they had to chaptalize up to 12.5 or 13%. Um, and chaptalization, just adding a little bit of sugar during fermentation, is an absolutely natural process that you know a lot of uh, French producers use. The nose on this uh, Chateau Merrick is very classic Bordeaux. Cedar, you've got cassis, blackberries. Uh, I'm already thinking that this wine is not just from the color, but from, from the nose. It's going to be a pretty tannic, intense, uh, definitely fuller bodied uh, than the Bon Premier Cru made with Pinot Noir. You can just tell from the nose initially. Now, what makes a very good Cru Bourgeois? Because we're not looking at the Cru Classé, we're looking at um, one of around 250 Cru Bourgeois. This is a classification that came um, 
right as a reaction to the 1855 uh, Cru Classé, where you had over 60 top chateaus classified in 1855, first growth, second growth, third, fourth, and fifth growth. And then the hundreds of produ very good Bordeaux producers said, well, what about us? You're only classifying the top 61. What about the rest of us? We, we, we are also very good. Among the 7,000 producers in Bordeaux, we are the handful that are really good. So in 1932, the Cru Bourgeois classification ha was established. And at that time, there were about 444 chateaus that got uh, the classification of Cru Bourgeois. And then it became um, a, 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 um, a, a renewable effort where you had to be classified every 10 years. Uh, and there was a, a little bit of a scandal in 2003, which meant that um, uh, they thought that the tasting panel that made up uh, and, and classify the Cru Bourgeois were actually biased and not impartial. So in 2007, they changed, um, they, they were taken to court and there was a big uh, court case. And since 2010, the Cru Bourgeois name came back on to, uh, to grace the bottles of Bordeaux. And this is a pure uh, tasting and quality about the wines assessment rather than uh, the reputation of the producer. And this is done by an independent party. And this wine obviously made uh, the ranking of one of the 250 or so Cru Bourgeois. So out of the 7,000, it is chosen as one of the few hundred that, um, that have a certain quality level. So it's a quality assurance, um, even at a Cru Bourgeois level, that you can find, which often offers very good value. And on the palate, uh, this Chateau Merrick is really round. Uh, the tannins are not harsh. And one of the biggest criteria or, or judgment on how you, um, how you assess whether a Cru Bourgeois and a Bordeaux has the quality level you're looking for is on judging the quality of the tannins. How much is there? So there should be enough tannins. The level should be medium to high. What is the quality, the texture? Is it grainy and coarse and rough? Or is it smooth and velvety? Is it really silky and soft? This is somewhere between velvety and smooth. So there is no coarseness at all. The tannins kind of glide over your tongue. And there's just this wonderful balance and uh, a, a good freshness. Mm. A great value wine that um, I would happily recommend to drink now. And uh, a wine that I think could probably stay at this level for at least the next three to five years. So that's the good thing about Bordeaux is that they're, they're easy to age. Uh, and Cru Bourgeois, they're, they're, they normally peak at around five years of age, and, which is just now, 2016. And over the next three, four years, they're at their peak and at their height. You enjoy them and you can probably keep them for several years uh, longer. So the lifespan is about 10 years and we're, we've just hit the peak uh, for this Cru Bourgeois. The next wine that we have is one of my favorites. This is uh, Chateau Bussejour Beco from saint Emilion. And I'm going to pour myself a little bit here. Now, just in case I have any questions, I will look very quickly to see if I will say, please ask questions. If there's any questions, um, please send them to me. I'm still waiting. But let's talk about this last Bordeaux. This is our fourth wine. And now we've moved from the left bank to the right bank. And you can see that 
you can see that um, when you're when you're moving in in Bordeaux, there's not just a, a difference in scenery. If you're in Bordeaux, you'll notice that on the left bank, especially in the heart of the Medoc, Poyac, Saint Julien, Margot, you're going to be driving through these grand, beautiful chateaus, and chateaus are castles, and they're they're so classic that throughout China I've seen quite a lot of castles built to look exactly like the ones in the Medoc. But when you go on to the, the right bank um, and you go to saint Emilion, you go to Pomerol, you'll see that there aren't these grand chateaus. And the first time I went about 20, over 20 years ago, I looked around and I thought, this looks like a, a farming town. Literally, there are just houses which, which uh, look like, some of them look like just sheds where they are making very small production um, wines. saint Emilion is a little bit bigger than Pomerol, but in general, the properties on the right bank, saint Emilion, Pomerol, um, all the uh, wonderful Côte wines, Côte de Bordeaux wines, the properties are smaller than the size of the left bank wines. Um, and uh, Bossager Beco is 22 hectares. And just to give you a comparison, um, you'll see that, you know, uh, if you look at uh, any of the first growths, um, Chateau Lafitte Rothschild, uh, Mouton Rothschild, Latour, for example, they're closer to about 100 hectares, so five times bigger. And, and this is very normal uh, to have the larger sizes on the left and the smaller, more family-run properties on the right. Uh, and and Bossager Beco is uh, run by the Beco family for many generations. And there is a lot more of the artisanal uh, history. So if you're the type of person who enjoys wine, you know, made by smaller families, uh, more artisanal uh, in the way that uh, it, it's, it's made and the fact that there just aren't as many wines in the marketplace, then, you know, especially Pomerol and the right bank is, is where you should go. So here is a 2012. And 2012 in Bordeaux is considered a very solid vintage, a good vintage, not a, not a great one, like the 2010 or the 9 or the most recent 2015, but it's considered a very solid vintage. And I think I like good vintages like this because they're not so overpriced like the ones that everybody is going out to buy. Um, but at the same time, I know that the majority of the properties produced wines of good concentration, good ripeness, balance, ripe fruits, um, as well as good acidity. So, the first thing I notice uh, as a difference between uh, the saint Emilion and the, the Medoc is because of the more of sweetness. And there are more spices, more sweet spices like cinnamon uh, and nutmeg. And I do get some, I do get some cedar box, but it's not as prominent as, uh, as in the reds of, of the Medoc. Mm. I think Bosse Jerbeco has done a fabulous job with the 2012, even though it's only four years old. You could almost drink it now because it has this velvety texture and this generosity, and the wine kind of comes at you like a warm, big teddy bear giving you a hug, both on your, on your palate as, as well as you know, on, your, on your senses. The, the, the flavors here uh, ranges from red and black plums uh, to, to a little bit of hint of licorice and, and, and some roasted coffee notes as well. Uh, it's a beautiful wine with great concentration. And here, it's not just the quality of the tannins as there was um, in Chateau Merrick, but it's, it's also the length and the power and the intensity. That, that just lingers. And here is, is where the quality assessment for the great wines um, of Bordeaux uh, comes in. 
is in the finish. It's in the concentration. It's in the layers and the complexity. And this wine has all of those things. And although it would be a shame to open it now, I really think it's a style of wine because of vacations. Because we know that on the left bank, we've got you know, the classified growths. There are five levels from first growth down to fifth. Centimillion actually, as a region, it's a pretty large region, especially compared to Pomerol, has four levels. And most people think of, oh, Centimillion has the Grand Cru Classé as one level, and of course Grand Cru as another level. But within it, there are also different layers. So let's start at the very top for Centimillion. So you have a classification called Premier Grand Cru Classé, and that's at the top of the level. And even within the Premier, it's divided up into Premier A, which is the top, and B, which is the second level. And if you look at the most recent classification of uh, Premier Grand Cru Classé, you'll see that A has four. Two properties, which is Angelus and Pavi, was promoted to A. And the two that have been at Premier Grand Cru Classé A for a long time is Chateau Ozone and Cheval Blanc. Then we have the B, which has about 14 um, chateaus. Then Grand Cru Classé, uh, as a classification, has another 63. So in that sense, it's very close to the, the left bank um, in having around you know, 60, 70 uh, classified producers. Now what's confusing is the Grand Cru, uh, Centimillion Grand Cru, of which there are over 200. And that gives you a, a, uh, a very confusing classification because you think that um, if it's Grand Cru, it should be just as good as the Grand Cru Classé. But it is very important to look out specifically for Grand Cru Classé. Okay, let me take a few questions. So someone asked about the 2015 vintage. I just tasted them recently, um, as, as did many people, and I think 2015 is a really great vintage. There was some controversy that there was uh, some inconsistencies, but the way I judge the vintage is really how good are the basic wines? How good are the basic generic Bordeaux? How good are the Cru Bourgeois? Not just the top wines. The top wines all made very, very good to excellent wines in 2015. But at the very generic level, um, you know, like the Chateau okay. Merrick and others at that Cru Bourgeois level made excellent wines in 2015. So in my opinion, 2015 is maybe not as good as 2010 vintage, but it has all the criteria to make it among the top vintages over the last 15 to 20 years. So I would highly recommend the 2015 vintage to buy even over the 09 and 15 at the moment because a lot of the chateaus understand that we were burnt from the high prices of 09 and 10. So they brought the prices down in 15. So there are a lot of wines that offer very good value. Now, let's see if there's any other questions. Um, if anyone has any questions about uh, Bordeaux in general or about um, these wines, I'm happy to answer them. Okay. Now, um, I think that um, someone asked about the, uh, the Centimillion wines and how they differ from Pomerol. Now, the difference is really in the grape varieties that are used because Pomerol is majority Merlot. So there's a roundness uh, and, 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 and even a, a kind of uh, intensity and, and sweetness and spices that is very different because in Centimillion there is a kind of an equal number of Cabernet Franc and Merlot used in the blend. So this is a, a very good um, blend uh, that, that, uh, that I think Centimillion producers can refer to because they can Depending on the vintage, they may use more or less of the Merlot or Cabernet Franc. So I hope that uh, I was able to answer some of your questions. 
uh, and that you can get more information all online, uh, including my tasting notes and um, the ratings and uh, background information on Centimillion or any of these classifications on wineworld.com. So it was a pleasure and I really enjoyed having this live stream. Thank you everyone.